spoke to us, said things in, in time, and came and revealed himself. I mean, physically, he could even be seen. So. Um, the apophatic negative knowledge and it is not the only kind of knowledge that we as Christians can have. So, two paradigmatic examples of positive mysteries, not thinking about religious stuff even, are very pertinent for our topic tonight, and, and this was just what came to my mind, but one is love, and the other is a human person. In each case, these are things that we can say are clearly true, I mean, I think they clearly exist, you know, we, we know something of what we mean when we say a human person, we know something of what we mean when we say love. There are people who are, um, in, in moments of depression, will say there's no such thing as love, and, and this and that, but um, I guess that would have to be another. <laughs> in each case, there, there are things that we can say about them, that we can know about each, and at the same time, we can never give an exhaustive description. Um, there's something intangible about both, and our intuitive thinking and descriptions on these matters derive from the intrinsic complexity and inexhaustibility of these realities. Um, I mean, it's not like your spouse or just a family member that you love, you're like, yeah, I've loved you enough now. Yeah, I got that one down. <laughs> Check, go on to something else. Or I totally know what it means and I can give you a one-line definition or something like that of you know, who Marcus is. You know? and not just in a nutshell, but that's it. Or something like that. That's not, that's not how reality is related to human persons, including love work. If love, meaning love within our own realm and the human person as a concept are such inexhaustible mysteries, Perhaps it gives us an extra way to understand, beyond just knowing that God's so, so high above us and all that, why the Trinity, the love and personhood of God himself, is such a mystery beyond all mysteries. It's a positive mystery, like that light that's too bright for us to look at directly for now, or that inexhaustible light, but we can catch glimpses of it, and, and it also sheds light on everything else. Now... Let's look further at why it might make sense that the Trinity can only be known by revelation. Because that's something else that also comes up a lot in, in conversations. The church has always taught that there are some things we can know about God philosophically. And it was also made a part of doctrine in Vatican I, but saints all the way back then talking about this. Although that doesn't mean without God's guidance. For instance, it is possible to know that God exists, God is one, God is good. These are things that various uh, Christian philosophers and others have said we can know philosophically about God. We might even be able to realize somehow that God must be a personal being, personal person in the sense of a being that knows and loves and isn't just some kind of infinite and personal machine that processes a lot and spews some out or something like that. Um, it'd be very odd, I think, to think that the one who created humans with the perfections of being able to think, that is to reason, not just to reason, but to intuit, to know, to seek truth, or to possess truth, and to will, which includes choosing and, and desiring and loving, would, if these are things that, perfections of the created human being, it'd be strange to think that the one who created them would or could itself lack those qualities and, and be some kind of lower and personal thing rather than having some sort of those qualities maybe something much higher but analogous. Of course, as Aquinas says, most people will never figure all this out on their own. Only a few with the mental and spiritual capacity and those who don't have their own internal spiritual battles going on that might keep them from wanting to see these things and who aren't too busy with daily tasks. Most of the people throughout history have way too much going on to sit around and, and philosophize. And who are people who are very dedicated enough, who live long enough, might eventually be able to figure these things out, um, given our natural, God-given endowments and observing the world around us and all that. Um, given this huge caveat, it's very good that God teaches us these things through special revelation as well. Um, certainly there's a sense in which it seems to me that religions the world over have had a sense that, that God or some kind of deity exists, but then there, there's a, a 
often an admixture of error, as they say. Um, so there's reason that even the things we could know naturally, I don't want to say on our own as if it's like apart from God or something, but naturally um, are taught to us through revelation, like that there is one God, things like that. Um, but there are other things we could never know about God if he didn't reveal them to us. So to use an imperfect but hopefully helpful analogy, it's kind of like getting to know the interior, right? interiority of a human person. There are things about my inner life, or to pick on you, about Allison's inner life that we could never know, um, certainly I could never know, not having met her personally before, but even things no one else besides God could ever know about her if she didn't choose to reveal them. These things have to do most closely with her or any of us being a person, having an inner life of knowing and loving. That's what the Trinity is about, in a sense, the way I'm thinking about it here. God's inner life as a personal being. God's inner life of knowing and loving. Except with God, this knowledge and love, this truth of his being, his being and the love that he is, is so real that these qualities are actually, to use the word loosely, personified. God is a personal being, analogous to you being a personal being who knows and loves, but God is a personal being in a mode that is way beyond us. It's not just that God is more of a person than we are. His mode of being is one of inner Trinitarian life in a totally um, mind-blowing way. Besides the fact that he's at a totally different level of being than us and outside of time and absolute, the absolutely uncaused source of all, etc., and other reasons that it might be hard for us to know a lot about this inner life if he didn't want to reveal it to us, um, there's something about the person, interpersonal nature that has to be revealed. And um, we hear the word revelation a lot, but it's kind of you need to think about it at that level. So, what else could you, or what could you, else could you not know about me if I didn't choose to reveal it, or about Allison, someone else, um, unless you had maybe second or third hand knowledge about it from someone. You also couldn't know things about my history, things that are contingent facts, not eternal truths, unless you encountered me or someone else who relayed the information to me. So you can probably guess the parallel that I might be going to draw here. Um, God's self-revealing words and actions during the course of history, uh, especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, are the ways that the eternal God, who's already creator and sustainer of all, not, no actions are happening without around anyway, acts especially within history at specific points in time. There are things we couldn't know unless we were there and blessed with the spiritual eyes to understand it correctly, or if this history was passed down to us, uh, passed down to us by others, and tradition precisely means handing over, passing on, by the way. Um, God became man and walked among us in a certain place in time 2,000 years ago. This is a fact about a moment in history taking place in the midst of the world's contingencies, even if God had always had it played out that way. We couldn't know it without the revelation that was Jesus Christ, God becoming man, and the passing on of that truth about revelation to, through the new family, the church, that Christ created and vouchsafed by promising to have his spirit guide and always protect the church from losing its core. Um, by the way, notice already that the way we're talking about Christ coming and what he did is taking on a Trinitarian shape. There's all three working together, and we associate, rightly so, the Father with creating and watching over us and sending the Son. We associate the Son with revelation and redemption and the Spirit with inspiring us and working through the church and the ages. Um, so gifts back to what the Catechism was saying, really. All of our faith is so Trinitarian in these ways that we probably... Um, Maybe never reflected on explicitly. When Christ was here in the flesh, revealing God's love for us and plans for our future, he also revealed, revealed things to us about his inner life, the inner life of God, that we can never know about otherwise, as I said before. It's like sometimes when a close friend tells you something very deep about themselves, you couldn't have guessed, couldn't have known for sure anyway, maybe you had some inkling of it. But once they tell you, you see how it fits so perfectly in it in with everything else and helps you understand other things about them. And then you can look back 
perhaps it's science from the past and now everything is so clear. You know, that, that one piece of the puzzle and now you just understand the person overall much better. It's not that you get them to where, like, you grasp them in the sense that uh, you can then make a one-line definition of who Marcus is, right? But you have a better feel for it. You, you see more of the big picture. Everything else takes about them takes on a new and deeper light because of what they shared with you. And I think the Trinitarian revelation is um, somewhat the same. Um, so, in the same way, perhaps we could have never guessed that the one God, source of all our being, creator of the universe, so high above us, in his inner life is triune. But once we're taught it, as the church, um, once we're taught it, we can, as the church did, begin to reflect on it um, and go ever deeper into the mystery. And that can mean going ever deeper in adoration, in theological reflection, and also discerning how it fits in with our lives and our destiny. Of course, this is what we're supposed to do as individuals, and also what our participation in the life of the church is in part. Uh, adoration, reflection, and discernment of significance for our lives and future destiny. So we see this in the New Testament proclamation, in the liturgy and the profession of the early church, in the creeds, and in the development of doctrinal statements, that arose over important misunderstandings, like I mentioned above. And what's more, we can take a second look at the Old Testament and the world, which some people call the book of nature, and see signs of God's three-in-oneness for what they are. And Professor Griffiths in the next lecture is going to talk about the Trinity in the scriptures. Um, so, so I won't go into a lot of detail on that, but he might focus, understandably so, on the New Testament. So briefly, I can mention that some see in the Old Testament signs of triunity. For instance, the use of we in the creation narrative in Genesis, in, in the visit of the three mysterious strangers to Abraham and Sarah, in the Psalms of Wisdom literature, where they speak of the spirit of God and the wisdom and word of God as personified and working with God and born before all the ages. It's not that the human authors necessarily realize these implications. Um, sometimes it gets misunderstood as that. Um, it, it would be kind of maybe far-fetched to think that that would be the case. It's, it's not that the human authors necessarily thought that. It's that the divine author providentially orchestrated these happy coincidences that take on a new meaning in light of the full revelation of Christ. And we can see analogies of the Trinity in the Book of the World, of nature, of human nature and relationships, like I said, and I will continue to fill out some of those analogies later in the talk, and we can also prayerfully reflect on God's inner life, both as he is in himself and more easily as it relates to us, 